time we'll sing the first and the last verse of song number 148. <clears throat> You know, each morning when we awaken, we should take at least a moment to realize that we will have to make a series of choices that comes our way throughout the day. Like that's what life is, really. Life is taking, uh, looking at our day and realizing that we have a series of choices to make each and every day. And for those of us who have not yet made the decision to become a faithful follower of Jesus Christ, a Christian, or for those who have had that chance and have done so in a fallen way, they've, they've either yet not realized the true importance the Bible places on their eternal soul, or they have known this maybe in some times in the past but are trying their best now as fallen Christians to not think about it. For those who are Christians, those who have evidenced their love, their honor, and their obedience to the Word of God, a day's choices will evidence how seriously they take the vows they have made to God in becoming a Christian. However, for those who have not yet become a Christian or for those who have fallen away, all the choices they choose to make during the day, with possibly the exception of one, have really no bearing at all on their eternal destiny for their choice to follow the God of this world has been made. Having had the last of my daughters to get married a couple of weeks ago has caused my mind to study upon the subject of marriage and its true importance in our lives. That being so, for the next couple of Sundays, I plan on sharing with you some lessons on the subject of marriage possibly touch on some things that we've touched on in times past, but these kind of things can continue to help us in our everyday walks of life as Christians because of the fact that God likens the marriage relationship to the relationship that we have with Christ as Christians in the church. Having said that, I would like to now ask each of us a question. How many of how many people do you think really understand that when they take the wedding vows in marriage that they have actually made a vow to Almighty God? You may have noticed what I said in my opening remarks about the fact that in becoming a Christian we evidence our love, our honor, and our obedience to the Word of God. And these same vows are those which we say to our prospective spouse as we begin our journey in marriage. We often hear these exact same words during a wedding ceremony in which a man and a woman make a solemn pledge to each other as well as to God, since God is ultimately the one who binds two people together in marriage, spiritually speaking, that indicates their intentions to live up to the expectations of their mate in the marriage relationship, to love, honor, and be obedient to one another. A marked false teacher among our brethren by the name of Ethelgard Smith authored a well-known book several years ago entitled Baptism, the Believer's Wedding Ceremony, in which he likens a person's decision to become a New Testament Christian to that of making marriage vows. He pointed out, and correctly so, that the acts of obedience involved in becoming a Christian are indeed vows that we make to God in becoming a member of the Lord's church, which, as I said earlier, is said to be the bride of Christ. We learn this in such verses as Revelation 22 verse, or 21, verse 2, and Revelation 21, verse 9. Though F. Lagarde Smith attempted to illustrate the great beauty and the similarity between these two life-changing relationships that occur in our lives, that of marriage and that of becoming a Christian, much could be said about the opposite side of the coin, about the world seemingly lacks a view about both of these things, the marriage relationship and being a Christian. However, we will spend most of our time in this lesson looking at those beautiful similarities between the marriage vows 
and the vows we make to God in becoming a Christian and a member of His bride. Lest we misunderstand the importance inherent in the vows we make to both God and man, let us first understand the meaning of what a vow really is. According to most reliable religious scholars, a vow is described as properly a wish expressed as a petition to God or in votive obligation, according to Strong's Hebrew and Greek dictionaries. Thayer's Greek definitions defines the same as simply a prayer to God, making a vow to Him. When we look at the worldly definition of the word, since not all people who take the vows of marriage do so in a religious sense, so to speak, Merriam-Webster's 11th Collegiate Dictionary defines the word vow as a solemn promise or assertion, specifically one by which a person is bound to an act, service, or condition, which gives us basically the same meaning as those used by our religious scholars. From this we see the importance of taking or making a vow because it is a petition to God that illustrates one's obligation to fulfill what they have proclaimed in that vow. Though some who choose to get married in this world may choose to write their own wedding vows, the most common wedding vows that we are familiar with are those that contain the words to love, honor, and obey. When one makes a vow to love their husband or wife, under what conditions does he or she make those promises? The answer to this question, for those of us who may have forgotten, is the same for both the bride and the groom. They make the promise to love each other with these conditions, to have and to hold from that day forward, for better or for worse, for richer or for poorer, in sickness and in health. And those words pretty well cover all of the various aspects of one's life or their life that they will spend together. This is true in the marriage relationship as well as our spiritual relationship with God. The meaning of love seems to be a point of contention in the world today in both the physical aspects of life and the spiritual areas of life. However, the meaning of love in the Bible is quite clear in the inspired words of John as he tells us that true Bible love includes the keeping of the commandments of God. In other words, being obedient. Notice what he says in 1 John 5 verses 2 and 3. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep His commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments. For His commandments are not burdensome. Of course, we should have this same attitude toward our spouse when we are asked to do something. Those commands are not burdensome. So a Christian illustrates their love to God and their own obedience to the commands of God, and yet, what does God command of both the husband and the wife in the following words of the Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 through 31? Notice what Paul says by inspiration of the Holy Spirit concerning our obedience to one another and our obligations as husband and wife. He starts at verse 22 by saying, Wives... Submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord 
does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And so we see that when submission ceases, as has been the case with so many women since the days of 1920 up to our current generation, the sin of divorce increases when submission increases, and statistics prove this without a doubt, when we do not take these vows to be obedient to one another and to understand our rightful places in the marriage relationship in a physical sense and a spiritual sense as Christians. We also understand that God's displeasure with mankind increases since we learn in Malachi chapter 2 verse 16 that God hates divorce. If God hates divorce in a physical sense on this earth, which is often due to physical fornication, how does he feel when true Christians cease to be obedient and begin playing the harlot with the false religions of this world? The answer, of course, is clear. God is no more pleased with spiritual fornication as he is with physical fornication. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 6 verse 9, fornicators will not inherit the kingdom of God. As we look at the next word in our common wedding vows, we notice the promise to honor those to whom we are about to be bonded to. Strong's Hebrew and Greek dictionaries define honor as used in Revelation chapter 19 verse 1 as esteem, especially of the highest degree or the dignity itself. While Thayer's definitions define the same as being that which belongs or is shown to one of the honor which one has by reason of rank or state of the office which he holds. As husband and wife, do you know that you have taken a vow to your spouse and to God to honor or to esteem them to the highest degree because of the position God has placed each of you in, in the marriage relationship. Husbands as the head, as we've just read in Ephesians 5.23, and the wife as one do honor and understanding because she is the weaker vessel. Yes, I did say the weaker vessel, for that is what is clearly taught in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7, where we read these words. Husbands, likewise, dwell with them, being the wives, with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life that your prayers may not be hindered. Though she has so many strengths that the husband does not have, God's word still says she is the weaker vessel. And as such, she is due the husband's honor and his understanding. God asked an interesting question about the honor due him in Malachi chapter 1 verse 6. He says there a son honors his father and a servant his master. If then I am the father, where is my honor? If I am the master, where is my reverence? Says the Lord of hosts, to you priests who despise my name, yet you say, in what way have we despised your name? Well, some of the ways in which those priests despised his name and paid no, no honor or reverence to him is seen in the words of Isaiah 58, 13 and 14. Where we read there, if you turn away your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy day of the Lord honorable, and shall honor him, not doing your own ways, nor finding your own pleasure, nor speaking your own words, then you shall delight yourself in the Lord, and I will cause you to ride on the high hills of the earth, and feed you with the heritage of Jacob your father. The mouth of the Lord has spoken. 
In other words, if we put God's choices before our own choices, God has pleasure in us and he is honored by our choices that we make. Would not that same behavior in our day and age be just as dishonorable if, if we acted the way those priests did? I think it certainly would be. It is apparent that there is just as much aversion and distaste for the word obey in the marriage relation today as there is in the religious world. That is a word that is hated in most religious uh, most marriage relationships is the word obey. A wife, act, some wives actually despise the thought of having to obey their husband. And likewise, many husbands despise the fact that they have to honor and reverence their wife as a weaker vessel in many cases. People have been taught to hate their respective roles in the marriage relationship that God has set up. Many have confused the word obey with the word liberty and act as if obedience to the word of God somehow includes doing only what one feels is pleasing to oneself instead of doing what is pleasing to God that is written. Did God accept such obedience in the Old Testament time? Well, of course he didn't. You may recall the words of the prophet Samuel in 1 Samuel 15 and verse 22. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifice as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. In other words, all of the outward appearances that man tried to offer that are really their own devices here on this earth as being pleasing to God, thinking they're being pleasing to God, is actually not what God requires of man. He requires them to obey his voice and do what he says because obedience is better than sacrifice. According to my research, it was on September 12, 1922, real close to that time of the suffragette movement or the feminist movement in this world, that the Episcopal Church voted to remove the word obey from the bride section of their wedding vows. Other churches of the Anglican Communion each have their own authorized prayer books, which in general follow the same wording as does the Episcopal Church. Naturally, this would help to remove from the mind of the wife God's desire for her submission to her husband that we have already referenced in our verses this morning, as well as contribute to the act of divorce and the divorce rate that has climbed since that time. As I mentioned earlier, statistics prove without a doubt that the feminist movement, or sometimes called the suffragette movement, of the 1920s began the breakdown in the marriage relationship that continues in the world today and has resulted in our current divorce rate. Though I've not done any research in the area of the increase in lesbianism since that time, I'm quite sure that there would be a color correlation in the same. When women are taught to disobey and to virtually hate the opposite sex, who else is there to turn to but their own sex? Just how many lesbians have any of us ever seen that were not feminist as well? The two mindsets really go hand in hand in most cases. And that is the hatred of the thought of being, of being obedient to the opposite sex. Keeping our vows to love, honor, and obey our spouse is key in a lifetime relationship as a husband and wife. These vows are just as important in remaining faithful to the bride of Christ, the Lord's church. The Bible is clear about God's feelings about divorce, as we've already read. Let's notice that again, the whole verse this time in Malachi 2, verse 16. It says, for the Lord God of Israel says that he hates divorce. For it covers one's garments with violence, says the Lord of hosts. Therefore take heed to your spirit that you do not deal treacherously. 
but it is also just as plain about how God feels about sexual contact outside of the marriage relationship that often causes these divorces. The Apostle Paul, writing to the church at Galatia, but stating a general truth to all mankind, warned these, this. He says, Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in times past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Galatians 5, verses 19 through 21. And a similar warning was given by Paul to the church of Christ at Ephesus, where he said, But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you as his fitting saints. Ephesians 5 and verse 3. When we examine the subject of sexual contact in the pages of the Holy Bible, we soon see that God's original intention for these special moments between a man and a woman are reserved solely for those who are in a covenant relationship with one another, being the marriage relationship. Any form of sexual contact outside of the marriage relationship has always been called such words as these, whoredom, harlotry, abomination, fornication, adultery, and all such words meaning illicit or unlawful sexual intercourse. And as such, they are sin, according to the word of God. In fact, God says by John, in 1 John 3 and verse 4, Whosoever committeth sin transgresses also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. Having these kind of relationships outside of the marriage relationship are sinful and will cause us to lose our soul. A casual Bible student will soon realize that the inspired penman of the Bible often compared the unlawful sexual acts of human beings to the unlawful practices of all forms of false religion that occurred in man's history. One such reference can be found in Exodus 34 verses 11 through 16, where the word of God warned his children, the Israelites at that time, Observe what I command you this day. Behold, I am driving out from before you the Amorite and the Canaanite and the Hittite and the Perizzite and the Hivite and the Jebusite. Take heed to yourselves lest you make a covenant, that is a vow, with the inhabitants of the land where you are going, lest it be a snare in your mind. But you shall destroy their altars, break their sacred pillars, and cut down their wooden images. For you shall worship no other God, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. Lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, and they play the harlot with their gods, and make sacrifice to their gods, and one of them invites you, and you eat of his sacrifice. And you take of his daughters for your sons, and his daughters play the harlot with their gods and make your sons play the harlot with their gods. We read another such comparison from the words of the prophet Jeremiah concerning the nation of Israel. In Jeremiah chapter 3 verses 8 and 9. These verses say, Then I saw that for all the causes for which backsliding Israel had committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a certificate of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Judah did not fear, but went and played the harlot also. So it came to pass through her casual harlotry that she defiled the land and committed adultery with stones and trees. Since it is plain to see that God views the relationship he had or he has with his chosen people as a type of marriage relationship. Should it surprise anyone that the rise in the world's divorce rates also seem to correlate with the rise in the number of false religions in the world? As has often been stated by our brethren, God's intentions for marriage is one husband and one wife for life. Should it surprise us then that God, though he is 
change the mode of worship in times past has never proved of a multiplicity of religions or religious division, such as we see in denominationalism today. And yet mankind treats God in much the same way and worse as the same way he treats the sacred bond of marriage in many cases proving his contempt for the vows that he makes in this life that are supposed to be lifelong. Though the Bible states that at one moment in time God had an exception for the hard-heartedness of mankind allowing divorce and for the putting away of one spouse, we know that his original intent for this relationship was lifelong. We read in Genesis 2, verse 24, that a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Well, there are doubtlessly much more included in the phrase to become one flesh than the implication of lifelong dedication to one's vows. Certainly that fact should be apparent from what these words mean and say. The same phraseology is actually used in the words of Christ recorded in Matthew chapter 19 concerning the marriage relationship. As we continue to read the Bible, we learn that God had the same intention for man's service to him in the spiritual realm of religion. Listen to what might be uh, unfamiliar words to some of us in Isaiah 46, verses 3 and 4. He said there, Listen to me, O house of Jacob, and all the remnant of the house of Israel who have been upheld by me from birth who have been carried from the womb, even to your old age. I am he, and even to gray hairs I will carry you. I have made, and I will bear. Even I will carry, and will deliver you. You see, that's a lifelong commitment. A lifelong commitment in their relationship. As long as love, honor, and obedience is there. And now to the familiar words of Christ speaking to John on the prison isle in the Patmos in Revelation 2 and verse 10. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested and you may have tribulation ten days. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. God expects faithfulness in the marriage relationship and in the Christian relationship until the end of our lives. From our study this morning, I hope we can see the apparent relationship between the breakdown in marriage and the breakdown in religious purity. Only by keeping the vows we make in both of these relationships, the marriage relationship and our relationship as Christians to the bride of Christ the church, can we remain pure and expect it to be lifetime? Our Christian walk begins when we have a love for his word to the point that we are willing to hear it and believe it and come to believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. That same love leads to a desire to right the wrongs of our past life and determine to live faithfully in the future, which is what the Bible calls repentance. We then honor Christ by confessing our belief in his sonship before witnesses and then obey his commands to be immersed in the waters of baptism. Did you notice all of those words in that vow? To love, honor, and obey. All of those parts that are in the marriage vow are included in our relationship to becoming a Christian to being part, being made part of the bride of Christ, being added to the bride of Christ. The Bible says after we have obeyed Christ in baptism, we are then added to Christ's church, which is called his bride in Revelation. And this is just... As we've seen, this important, the importance that the Bible places on this relationship is the same importance that he places on our relationship in marriage. The world has a very flippant attitude toward the marriage relationship. 
If you've never noticed that before, just talk to someone who's been recently married. Or just talk to someone who knows other people who's been recently married. And listen to the things they say about the marriage relationship. So many people don't even go into a marriage relationship even thinking that it will last. Much less with the intentions to make it lifelong. Many of them go into it thinking, well, if this doesn't work out, I can just simply get me another mate. And in many cases, that's exactly what they do. When we make a commitment to someone to have a marriage relationship with them, we are making a, a vow to them, a promise. And it's a lifelong promise. And it's not only a vow that we make to one another, it's a vow that we make to Almighty God. Because God intends for that marriage relationship to begin right, to end right, and to be right all during the time that it exists. God expects faithfulness in our marriage relationship just like He expects faithfulness in our Christian relationship. That being said, the lesson is yours this morning. If you have a need to respond to the gospel invitation in any way, we pray that you would make your needs known as we sing the invitation song at this time. Song number 148, first and last verse. <laughs>